Welcome everyone to Griffith Observatory for the fourth out of five talks here on our Apollo celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first landing of people on the moon 50 years ago today, Jan uh, July 20th, 1969. We have had an all-day celebration, many talks looking back at Apollo, talking about whether those moon landings happened or didn't happen. Uh, talking a little bit about the moon, and our last two today are about the future. Uh, in particular, the Artemis program that NASA is uh, undertaking. How many of you have never heard of the Artemis program? So that's a pretty good significant number. By the end of this talk, you will know what the Artemis program is. And then our talk at 3 o'clock will be about our long-term future. If we look back 50 years ago to our, uh, our presence on the moon, what will our presence be like 50 years from now? Will there be settlements? Will there be manufacturing? Will we all one day live on the moon? Uh, so um, uh, with that, I'd like to welcome my guests. At the end uh, side here is veteran space journalist Leonard David. You may have read one of his books or articles that he's written for National Geographic. And I mean, his list is way too long to even go through. Um, and so, Katie, you may want to help these people who are going out the wrong way. Um, uh, and, um, and next to Leonard is Tony Cook, astronomical uh, observer here at Griffith Observatory, and uh, an expert on all things space exploration. So I've got two very able assistants. I'm Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory. And, We'll get started in just a second. A little, little confusion here in the theater. So as mentioned, our talk today, uh, oh, let me also just say, uh, I want to say thank you to Friends of the Observatory, um, our sister partnership organization that supports so much of what we do, including our fifth grade field trip program. So if you are here, this is a free program. If you're so inclined, we'd be so grateful, and the fifth graders of Los Angeles would be so grateful if you might put a little donation in one of the donation bins to Friends of the Observatory around the building, or consider becoming a member. And then lastly, I'd like to thank the City of Los Angeles, Department of Recreation and Parks. Griffith Observatory is a city park. You may not know that. So if you pay taxes, and I hope you do, um, <laughs> then you are also helping support the mission of Griffith Observatory to share the sky with uh, our visitors. So with that, let me turn to Artemis and the return to the moon. Are we ready to go back to the moon? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what we're here to discuss. <laughs> so we did it once, and then we stopped. And we talked a little bit about that in the last talk. So the first thing we need to get back to the moon is we're going to need a rocket that's going to take us there. So Tony, what's the, what's the story on that? Do we have a rocket? Well. Um, Sort of. <laughs> so if we start, if we look at how uh, or where we are today, it really goes back to the space shuttle, which is what followed Apollo. Uh, the space shuttle program is what we had from uh, 1981 until 20, 2011. And uh, uh, had, uh, almost, I had about 199 missions, I think, orbiting the Earth and uh, assembling things like the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, numerous satellites and stuff, and finally the space station. Um, but there were two serious accidents that uh, cost the lives of, of the crews. And uh, people were thinking the expense of the space shuttle, which originally was supposed to be cheaper than, to fly than other rockets and really wasn't, and both in terms of money and lives was getting too high. So uh, the space shuttle program was called to an end uh, uh, in 2003, they said by about 2011 or so that it would fly its last flights. And am I correct? 2011 or 2012? Go ahead. Yeah, I, in any case, <laughs> one of those days. Uh, I believe it was 2011. <coughs> in any case, the uh, uh, writing was on the wall that the space shuttle was over. 2011, I'm being told by the real space experts here, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, so a replacement for you know what the human space program in the United States uh, had to be found. And already we had partnered with the Russians. Uh, we had flown our space shuttle to the Mir space station. The Russians started building the International Space Station. And so really our human space effort has been a cooperative thing with Russia uh, all through you know, most of the space shuttle program. 
And uh, so a, a replacement was going to be found. And the administrator of NASA came up with a plan called Constellation that was going to utilize the manufacturing uh, infrastructure that had been established for the space shuttle, but it would be more like Apollo in that its goal would be to uh, kind of replace the space station with missions to the moon. And in fact, to afford it, the space station would have had to have been scuttled around 2016 or so. So, um, so the, to replace it was the uh, uh, Constellation. It consisted of two kinds of rockets, a crew carrying small rocket called Ares-1, which was really an uh, enlarged uh, space shuttle solid rocket booster, and, and an Orion capsule, which I'll explain a little bit more about. And then there's the Ares-5, which was a heavy lift booster, sort of like a Saturn V, yet using space shuttle engines and solid rocket boosters. And Ares-5 was conceived to be enlargeable, like if you wanted to use it for missions to Mars, you'd need a bigger version of it than you would for the moon. But the idea was to get back to the moon, kind of reestablish what we were doing with Apollo, go on beyond it if there were reasons to, and, um, and then go on to Mars. Um, okay, so uh, to do this, um, well, to do this actually turned out to be requiring a budget that was way beyond what NASA was getting at the time. And so the Constellation program was, was halted in uh, about 2010. And, uh, and then there was kind of debate, well, what are we going to do? Well, uh, elements of the Constellation program survived. And instead of the Ares rocket, the big <laughs> rocket that NASA would work on became called the, the Space Launch System, or SLS, and it still is. And uh, it would carry the Orion capsule. But there was no funding for any kind of lunar lander or anything like that. So uh, its mission kept changing. One idea was to fly it out to a near-Earth asteroid and bring a piece of it uh, close by. And then that got changed to sort of a robotic mission that would bring it close to the moon. And you fly the SLS there. But it was kind of vague as to what the purpose of the SLS and Orion was going to be. Orion, though, got its start back in Constellation, and it was always pictured as being kind of a, kind of like the Apollo capsule, but able to stay in space much longer than an Apollo capsule. And for various missions, different styles of SLS are possible. Before we move off the SLS, what is its status? Have they developed it? Are we Well, fine? it's being built. Um, <laughs> it uses engines that were used in the, the space shuttle mission, so, or the space shuttle service, uh, so we know those, those are ready. It uses solid rocket boosters that are derivative and actually using direct parts from flown missions from the space shuttle. Um, so those things are, are in, on way, but the funding for it has not been complete to do it on any kind of schedule, so it keeps falling behind. What is the schedule now? When do they say um, it will fly? I believe the first flight could be as early as 2021. Um, more likely 2022, <laughs> and, um, and it's expensive enough that uh, NASA can probably only afford to fly it something like once a year, maybe once every eight months or so. So it, it's a very expensive system, but it is what's being spent, the money's being spent on. And our part. return to the moon is dependent on it. Well, the current architecture is, uh, but and we'll, we'll discuss it, uh, okay. but there are other possibilities. So another component necessary for our return to the moon that is now up under uh, consideration is this. That's right. Well, um, this is called the Lunar Gateway. Um, do you, can you say anything about how Lunar Gateway started, Leonard? I, I'm sorry, but I, 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 I'm aware it exists, but I, it, it existed before Artemis, and I'm not sure... St it exactly. started as a drawing, and it's pretty much the same. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, they have uh, invested in uh, the power and propulsion module. Which is the, which is the, the yeah, area. with ion thrusters, and a, uh, there has been a good contract let for that, and they're moving ahead on building it. The thing about the gateway, which is fascinating to me, is 
<clears throat> and this is sort of the criticizing part of, uh, of the thing. It, it really has been a lightning rod for a lot of critics that want to go direct to the moon. Maybe now, I'll interrupt long enough okay. just to say what the gateway is. Yeah. As you can see from this diagram, it's like a space station, but it's an orbit around the, the moon, not in orbit around the Earth. Right. And by comparison, it's quite a bit smaller than the International Space Station, but it is meant to be a hub from right. which uh, <clears throat> we can launch missions to the surface. So now go back, Leonard, to what you were saying well, about the fact it, that it, this it, is a lightning rod. It's really, rod. to me, one of the things, I went to the, in Denver, I'm, I'm from Boulder area, and they had a, a major science conference on this thing. And uh, it was telling because in the, in the uh, oh, the you know, audience was the guy that I knew, and I said, well, what do you think of this? He says, I don't think this is ever going to happen, but if it does, I've got to be here at the meeting. And that's sort of what everybody is wondering, is what can you use this for? And there's a lot of scientific utility for this. One positive thing in my mind, and I think at, at the end of the day I'm a supporter of this, NASA is going to be lucky to get this. And they're going to need to get this because NASA needs to get its space legs back. It's been in low Earth orbit uh, for a long time. A lot of young people now at the agency they need deep space training. I think this is a, a good tool. And if you can't pull this off, forget about the moon and getting lunar bases up and operating. So I'm, I'm, right now, I'm pretty positive about this uh, facility. It's, it's a very controversial technology. But um, my guess is this is probably going to, some version of this is going to happen. And again, the artwork is always cheap. So you can start cutting off things and, you know. Uh, I, I think effectful. there is one other thing about Gateway, too, that maybe is based on history. And that is that the International Space Station doubles as kind of a safe haven for a crippled <coughs> spacecraft. Yeah. Um, so if uh, something's wrong with either what's docked to the space station or if a space shuttle had been damaged and, there, and it had been possible to go to the space station, well, that's where they could have gone. So I think, uh, there's, I think there's maybe even sort of a subconscious thing of being leery about launching deep space missions without some place in space to go in case you can't really get back to the Earth. And this fulfills that. How about moving part of the space station to the lunar orbit? Just, it's already up there. Let's move it. That would take a whole lot more energy than I think we can muster. As you can see from the uh, gateway configuration here, it's also planned to be an international hub. So it's not just a NASA effort, it is an international effort as well. Japan has already signed up, Canada. Uh, Russia initially was very interested in being a part of this. So, And the NASA administrators going around the world trying to keep everybody on board as Congress hand waves uh, whatever they're going to be doing with the money. So uh, it, it's an active program. And like I said, I, I really think this is or some hybrid of this is going to happen. I, I should point out to Orion, uh, which you see there with the ESA and NASA logos, uh, was originally going to be an all NASA project, but uh, ESA volunteered to build the first uh, service module on a test mission. That's the part that carries the rocket that uh, allows it to maneuver away from the Earth and, <laughs> towards the moon and back, and, the, and a lot of supplies. And that really has become a permanent feature now. So that already is an international project. And how far along is the Orion capsule? Is that also being, uh, the, is there metal being bent? Oh, yes. In fact, the one that will carry, do the first robotic mission, EM-1, which we'll mention, uh, is already largely complete, at least the, crew, the command module part. So it's almost ready to fly. And there are some technologies that still are being developed for this. And yeah, can you say a little bit about that? The, service, uh, the high power solar propulsion system was originally designed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but there's a private uh, company, and I don't know the name of it. I'm Maxar. Maxar, okay, yeah. that, that is now contracted to build it. So they are building, bending metal on it as we speak. So I'm these sure things, furiously. these developments were already underway, and this is all being uh, pulled together in a program as we mentioned in the title, called Artemis. Now, I'm just going to say a few words about what Artemis is. You can see the Apollo patch on the left that went uh, 50 years ago. Artemis is, in Greek mythology, is Apollo's sister. 
So twin sister. So um, this is nice to have a goddess to take us back to the moon. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, you've probably seen, if you've seen anything about it at all, that they do intend to have the first woman land on the moon and the next man is how they keep talking about it. So uh, this patch just came out a couple days ago. There are a couple of uh, small things I want to point out about it. And that is that uh, here we've got the Earth. And then this A for the Artemis, one of the things they like to point out is that the apex of that cone goes beyond the moon because Artemis is meant to be a stepping stone going to the moon on the way to deeper space missions to Mars. So they very deliberately designed that so that it points the way beyond the moon and onto our deep space uh, exploration, hopefully, to Mars. The other thing I thought was kind of interesting is that, as you can see, this little curve of the rocket trail to the moon goes from left to right, whereas from Apollo it went from right to left. And I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but I guess uh, that they made a point about it, so I'm sharing it with you. And of course, we've got the Earth at the bottom showing that all of this is intended to benefit uh, us here back on Earth. So Artemis is divided into a couple of missions. Our next mission is Artemis 1. Yes, this is a test of the command and service module, the Orion capsule and the European made service module on a mission uh, to the moon and then eventually back to Earth. And it's a, it'll be at least 25, 26 days to over 40 days, uh, depending on, uh, on what time of year it launches. It has to do with the orbit that it gets in as it, or the trajectory that it takes to the moon. So there's no crew on board. Here's a crazy little diagram right. showing you what it's supposed to do. Well, so let's we're start sure with point read. one. Yeah. No, um, ac actually, the main, main point of this is, is that it will head towards the moon it will originally, it'll initially go into a low orbit, close past by the moon, and then it will maneuver out to different orbits at great distances from the moon as the, uh, the gateway eventually will be. So uh, it'll be to test all of the maneuverability of that capsule and then return it to the Earth and plunge through the Earth's atmosphere at the required 25,000 miles per hour, or I should say inevitable 25,000 miles per hour, um, and make sure it lands safely and would support a crew in, in there before we actually do this with people. And what is the time scale for Artemis 1? Again, it really depends on the SLS, but I think by 2022 uh, uh, is the earliest this would fly. Then the next phase, Artemis 2. That's right. So uh, assuming that Artemis 1 is successful and there's no huge problems to fix, then uh, the same kind of mission would be done with the crew, although not, not quite as long a, a mission. This would be just to make sure that humans can actually operate it and, and are safe in it. So um, th this would be yeah, a loop around the moon, uh, maybe not in orbit, actually, and then um, head back to Earth. And then finally leading to Artemis three to land the first crew in 2024. That's right. And so for this, other elements will need to be in place. So well, I guess the gateway is fine for this, yeah. right? Yeah, whatever the other elements are and how, how fast they can be developed. And then you get really the money factor, how much money is going to be allocated. And I, I think in my tenure of writing about space exploration, there is no smooth sailing in these things. Something will go awry, something will <laughs> blow up, something will... Something will even be even better than they designed. So um, we got ways to go, but uh, you know, at least I think we're off and running into some kind of foggy future. But it looks it looks promising. I'm getting older, and I, you know, after the cataract surgery, I'm, it's clearer now. <laughs> well, what, one thing that's been said about this though is that uh, the the gateway actually does not need to be fully deployed. Uh, basically, the Orion capsule will need something to dock to, and the lunar module that has yet to be made for this, or even revealed what it's going to be, has to be docked to this, uh, um, and a habitat for the you know astronauts to stay in and when they get back from the moon and, and all. So it doesn't have to be a full up laboratory like the International Space Station, but it needs some key parts in order to carry off the Artemis III mission. You can add those other parts later, just like we add parts uh, to the International Space Station. It can grow. 
So this is the overall arc of the whole Artemis program, getting us to the surface by 2024. Um, you know, you may not know, I, I actually sat on a White House panel for nine months, the Synthesis Group, which was also called the Stafford Commission, back in 1993, that had the mission, uh, had as its task to identify the pathways back to the moon and on to Mars, and that was in the early 1990s. Then you talked about Constellation in the early part of this century, not enough funding, didn't actually happen. Now we have this, you're talking about unknown funding, unknown architecture, kind of a foggy future. I so, served on a commission myself. We we're all kind of, you know, uh, abused uh, reviewers. Uh, but I sat in this National Commission on Space that Reagan put together uh, and, uh, and the uh, Congress. And we had Neil Armstrong on there. We had 15, 16 pretty impressive people grappling with the future. And as we finished, Challenger blue, and uh, I can't be you can't believe the White House calls. Get the report out because we just lost some astronauts, and then as it got more complicated because of the tragedy, the White House calls uh, and says, "Hold on to the report. Don't let that out yet." So we were in uh, kind of an interesting mode, and we thought, "My God, people are going to get this report." And we put people on the moon, on Mars. We had Great artwork, Robert McCall painting pictures, and you know this is what happens. Yeah. You know, you just get this herky jerky issue, no so continuity. What's the difference between then and now? Why was Apollo able to do it in eight and a half years, and here we are, forty-five years of studies later, and a, some a little metal bending, um, and uncertain? What What's different? I think these guys said it the other day. You know, just again, the passion of uh, the Apollo program was fueled largely by the Soviet Union, you know, the space race. And as a kid growing up, that was a meaningful thing. I mean, uh, diplomacy, working with the Soviet Union, uh, Khrushchev said, and yet uh, they didn't want to come on board the Apollo program. But we had that um, spark of competition. And, uh, and uh, the thing that's very interesting to me, I've been trying to collect all the Apollo articles that, and there have been a huge amount of, of great pieces written by everybody. And the thing that kind of you forget, we went through Mercury, Gemini, to get to Apollo. You know, they're all doing Apollo 11, but to get to Apollo 11, a huge migration of capability had to be evolved. And there were failures, there were successes, lots of successes to build up to the Apollo 11, but that that's sort of the stepping stone approach, which I think NASA is going to have to have to get uh, its legs underneath itself again to go deep space. So we don't have the Cold War anymore, but we do have a different force at work, and that is the presence of commercial space. There are a lot of people interested in the moon besides NASA. So, Tony, do you want to say a few words about that? Yes, well, one, well, NASA, I, I, let me, back up a bit. There are a number of companies that have been working with NASA and also competing in private competitions from the Google X Prize and things like that, or I should say uh, Google Lunar X Prize, to develop uh, the ability to land small craft on the moon. And uh, so there has been a lot of development work done on small lunar landers. Um, so this has now been taken under the umbrella of Artemis. And uh, so private companies are working on lunar landers. Um, and these, these are small enough that like universities could buy in, or build an experiment and fly it to the moon as a piggybacked on some other launch like SpaceX does with launches. So it's using commercial, uh, commercially available resources uh, these don't have to launch on NASA rockets. Um, you might be aware uh, when SpaceX launched uh, a few months ago, they actually launched a small lander from Israel to uh, try to land on the moon, which failed, but it came very, very close to uh, actually landing on the moon. So these can be used almost as ballast on big rockets now. And uh, 
and so to spur that on, uh, you know, we need to learn. We might need to learn more things about the moon to even get people in some of the areas that they're planning on landing, and we could send small scout craft that may not be very expensive compared to you know what they cost back in the 1960s. Um, Orbit Beyond has plans for landing a small uh, rover with experiments built at UC Berkeley. Um, it could go soon. Um, as soon as the uh, the Artemis program was announced and the goal of landing people on the moon by 2024 was announced, Jeff Bezos a couple of days later unveiled his Blue Moon Lander, which is a, a you know, Jeff Bezos, of course, uh, you all interact with probably through Amazon one way or another. And uh, he owns his own rocket company, Blue Origin. He, he very shortly will pl be flying passengers on suborbital flights. Um, but he's also working on giant rockets for the, the government and his own private rockets. And one thing he's been working on for years is a lunar lander, which he unveiled. So I think some of these things may be a little farther along than anybody has uh, revealed yet, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and already they're testing the landing engine for this Blue Origin uh, uh, Blue Moon lander. Now, um, there's kind of a double-edged sword, it seems to me. It's great to have all these entrepreneurial efforts and, you know, the more people trying and some competition to stir it on, spur it on. But uh, then there's the problem of integration, if we're really going to work together. Um, and so maybe, Leonard, I'd love your thought about that. It, you know, on balance, is this a good thing to open it to commercial, or, or does it add complication? In our... our uh, session the other evening with the Apollo engineers, we were talking about the extraordinary project management to make sure that every component of the Apollo mission, all built by different companies, could talk to each other and work together. Do we face that problem here? Some people are working in feet and others in meters or yeah. some problems like this? Uh, yeah, I'm still agnostic on this. I, I think it's great. I think, you know, Jeff Bezos, to, in my mind, is a business person. In fact, everybody that spent a lot of money on prime time or whatever it was, you know, you helped build the space program. So you're actually part of the, part of the process here. Um, I, I'm pretty optimistic about this. NASA is too. They have developed public-private partnerships. And they just, NASA just selected a, a trio of lunar landers from the private companies to take NASA science experiments down to the moon's surface. So, that's a positive thing because, as you said, one of the things about the moon, people think it's a been there, done that place, and it's not. And we there's strategic knowledge gaps, and we better do some really fundamental science um, if we're going to have long-term permanence on the, on the lunar surface. So we've got a long way to go uh, on that. But this is a great step. I think it's, this is one of the big differences this go-round. I do expect a lot of extra craters on the moon, however, <laughs> um, and Israel just added a new one. So <laughs> I, I don't. I, I think the uh, robustness that we're going to have to see from the commercial folks is still to be determined, and uh, it it's a it, it is a double-edged sword, because yeah. a lot of the private companies don't want NASA breathing heavy on them with a bunch of requirements. They want to be innovative. They want to be whatever. And um, sometimes the fast-paced nature of innovation leads to a problem that uh, they didn't have enough money to really wring out of the system. You, you might remember uh, SpaceX announced that they were going to launch people into space by 2017, and today it was announced at the Apollo 50th anniversary at Cape Canaveral that private companies will be launching people into space by 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so. so it's a moving target. <laughs> yeah. uh, one last little <laughs> feature orbit. about Artemis that uh, I wanted to mention is that unlike the Apollo missions that went in more or less equatorial uh, regions that were flat in the mare, which are uh, these large lava fields that were comparatively safe, the Artemis program is targeting the lunar south pole. And if you came to my talk earlier about the uh, mysteries of the moon, there are craters in the South Pole that are permanently in shadow that are thought to be home to water ice. So if we're going to have a long-term presence on the moon, we need to have access to in-situ resources, and water is one of those key resources. So you were talking about knowledge gaps. This is one of them. 
where can we find water? Can we find, is there a sufficient water in those craters to make a long-term presence on the moon even feasible? Because without water, it makes it a whole lot harder. So this will be where we're headed in our next talk, is to look beyond 2024 and into the long-term, uh, you can see the in-situ resource utilization there, precision landings, all kinds of things that we will need to develop. Uh, so first we have to get back there, and then we have to develop this infrastructure, and that will, I think, be uh, discussed more at our 3 o'clock three o'clock program. So um, we've been trying to keep these talks to a half an hour. It's been half an hour, but I do want to give the opportunity for one or two questions if there are any questions in the audience. Yes, and back. Is there, with regards to Gateway, is there any thought to opening access to the commercial flights in case they want to have people eventually landing on the moon themselves? So the question is, will Gateway be open to commercial enterprise as well. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think the plan is to do that. Um, you know, again, if uh, I live in Colorado, so Lockheed Martin has been very busy trying to help NASA. They have a master plan of how to do this by 2024. So they got some really interesting lander designs, and I think it's stimulated a lot of other discussion. However, the one thing that happened the other day in the Senate you got the NASA administrator is kind of hand-waving how much money all this is going to cost and, and where is the technology and where are the landers. And so we've got a ways to go and the more fidelity is going to have to happen from NASA for the Congress to really bite the bullet and spend the money on some of these aspects. What about but the commercial sector would be good. What about the possibility of using Bigelow though for a gateway? Bigelow is um, in there. This is Robert Bigelow, a, guy, a hotel uh, mogul, uh, billionaire, uh, very interesting character, and um, has inflatable structure. He has one uh, small one on the International Space Station, actually, and, and it has proven that these inflatable structures may be a part of the future. And he's, he's already got, again, drawings of what the lunar base would look like with inflatable structures. So, uh, so the private sector is engaged right now, and I think it's a very positive and uh, productive uh, element now, different than Apollo. So, um, uh, one more question, yes. Uh, just thinking about the, the political will that has to happen and the symbolic you know, nature of who you choose to do these missions to actually go, has there been any discussion of who would be chosen in terms of like, oh, the first woman on the moon or the next man to come back to the moon? Is there any discussion like that or is it too early for that sort of thing? Has there been discussion about who would be the crew to go, or is it too early? I, I, I've, I've seen pictures of the female astronauts right now, so they've got, I don't know, a dozen of them. You know, about 11. Whatever, 11, yeah. you know, and so they're, you talk to any one of those, they're ready to go. So uh, I don't know about the, uh, the male astronauts. I mean, we, we'll get there. You know, it's, it's always part of the fun of who gets selected to go. And... Uh, you know, uh, so we'll have Neil on Buzz S, whatever her name. <laughs> Buzz S. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll pick up part two of this conversation at three o'clock, but I also want to invite you back tomorrow night because Leonard uh, has written a book called Moon Rush um, that is all about this, about all the different forces at play. Um, this is just a teeny a tip of the iceberg of his knowledge on the subject, and he'll be doing a... Uh, a moon, uh, a, a book talk tomorrow night, and a signing. If you wish to choose to get his book, uh, you can actually get it in the bookstore. Maybe he'll sign it today. But uh, you know, uh, come back or tune in to our live stream broadcast, and you can hear him talk in much greater depth on this uh, tomorrow. So with that, I'd like to close this session. We'll be back at three for a look beyond 2024. <laughs>